So this is velocity and acceleration and polar coordinates. So we could label x and y axis, but of course we're going to be in polar coordinates, so that's pretty useless. And we have some curve like this. And we're going to look, of course, at a point on the curve, but it doesn't have an xy value, it has an r data value. So the way we're going to measure that, and I'll go in blue. So we have an r value and a theta value. And there's our point right there. So we have our vector. And for some reason, we'll use capital R for that. And it'll have two components, an R component and a theta component. And of course, R, these are scalars. So I have these labeled as u theta and u r. I don't know why we're using u's. It's I think this is the unit, probably the unit vector in the r direction, the unit vector in the theta direction. Mm -hmm. Is that? Is that in uh, dynamics too? The u, they use for unit? Yeah, they, they use that just to show, um, kind of like they use i and j to show axes. It's just the unit. So what these are is basically a local frame at that r theta point. So you'll have one going in the, you could say, outwards direction from the origin, or maybe in the r direction, and then the other one going perpendicular, which would, if, if we were using a polar grid, we would be on some radius right here. So it's going tangent to that circle right there. So it's a strange way to measure this is not to be confused with the tan, uh, the velocity vector. All right. So this is not the velocity vector. If I drew a velocity vector, which I will put on for a second and erase it, our standard velocity vector would look like that right there. It would be parallel. It would be tangent to our curve, and then uh, whatever speed we're going would be longer or shorter. So that is not the vector that I'm talking about right here. So we have a rotation matrix. And this matrix is going to be a 2 by 2. It's going to go from R2 to R2, so the Cartesian plane to the Cartesian plane. And it's going to rotate theta counterclockwise. And this matrix is cos theta, negative sine theta, and sine theta, cos theta. So you probably use that in physics a few times. So we could try real quick what is uh, m pi over 2. So I'm just going to take pi over 2 and drop it in for all my thetas. So a really fast example, minus sine pi over 2, sine pi over 2. So the cos pi over 2s are 0, sine pi over 2 is a 1. We got 0, negative 1. 1, 0. So according to what I wrote, this should rotate pi over 2, 
or a quarter rotation counterclockwise. So if I have some generic point, x, y, if it rotates, if we think about where this point's going to rotate when it goes 90 degrees counterclockwise, so it's going to go from quadrant 1 to quadrant 2, it, now you have to use your visual imagination here. So it's going to keep the same radius, but it's going to go uh, quarter rotate, or yeah, quarter rotation, counter, counterclockwise, yeah, counterclockwise. So it's going to look something like that right there. So we had some theta value. Whatever theta was, it will be theta plus pi over 2. It needs to preserve the radius, though. So the radius better be the same. Just totally overwrote the y. So that's supposed to be a y value. All right, I can write down the coordinates over here. What are the new coordinates of this point? And it's not negative x. This is tricky to see. So it should go negative y comma x, like that. That's tricky to see. So this measurement right here was x, and that turns into uh, that measurement right there. So the original x becomes the new y. And the original y measurement right here, which was positive, will become the new x measurement, except it's also going to become negative. So a quarter rotation is kind of nice because you can see it. If I did a pi over 4, things would get a lot more ugly. We'd have to get, we couldn't just sort of eyeball it. So that's what coordinates uh, x, y will turn into with a quarter rotation. And it turns out this is true no matter what quadrant I put x, y in. Even if I put it on a coordinate axis, it wouldn't matter. So let's go and multiply. We're going to use column vectors now. using our matrix M uh, at the pi over 2. So all we do is multiply. So our M was 0, negative 1, 1, 0. And multiplying by the column vector x, y. Is that supposed to be 1, 0? Uh-oh. Yep. All right, so we're going to cross and then down. So we're going to get zero x's minus y. And then in our, in our bottom row, we're going x plus zero y. So we get minus y x. Now, if you want to really nerd out on linear algebra, which of course I always do, and so should you, you have this property right here, magnitude uh, splits up over multiplication. Or I, should, I said magnitude, but it's also true with uh, determinants. So it's also true. So x here is a, maybe we'll go av for vector, because I already used x. So that'll be determinant of a times the magnitude of the vector v, right there. And if this is magnitude preserving, meaning if whatever my radius r is, if I want r to be preserved, which anytime you rotate, you're going to preserve your radius. 
that means I want the property that uh, I want the magnitude of my transform vector to be the same as the magnitude of the original vector. Um, so this is magnitude preserving transformations. So you're going to do transformations in, I believe, calc 4. And the magnitude of your transformation matrix is called the Jacobian. And that's going to tell you how volumes change from one coordinate system to another. Uh, rotation matrices are nice because they don't change magnitudes at all. So whatever your measurements were before, they're going to be the same thing over here. So if you have two, any vector is going to turn into not the same vector, but have the same magnitude. Uh, and if we look at what is the actual determinant of what I said, it was cos negative sine, cos theta, negative sine theta, sine theta, cos theta. All right, so this is the magnitude of matrix M, regardless of what theta it is. All right, so compute this determinant quickly. Well, I know it's one. So I just talked about it. We're going to preserve that too. So compute it. You go. A, B, C, D, C, D. Ugh. Writing and talking at the same time is difficult. All right. So all of you seem interested in this because it's probably too easy. So I get cos squared minus negative sine squared theta equals 1. All right. So it doesn't matter what theta is. This will preserve our magnitude. And what is the formula for u r and u theta? I'll write those down up here. That was a little digression into linear algebra, which you'll see soon enough. u r is cos theta i plus sine theta j, and u theta sine theta i plus cos theta j. So that's u r and u theta. So you can tell right away those are units. Take their magnitudes, you know, square each component, add it together, definitely one. So it's really obvious they're units. Oh, there's a negative sign. Oh man. All right, this comes right from the uh, rotation matrix. Uh, another way you can write the vector r, you can write it as the scalar. So that's the amount, the magnitude of the distance you go from the origin times u r. So take the ur vector that direction, and then go whatever magnitude uh, r originally had, which I, I labeled as little r right there. Yeah. I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the question, but you said these come from the rotation matrix, and the rotation matrix goes cos theta negative sine theta sine theta cos theta. I don't know. Well, of course, you're doing the inverse. Oh. So was it? I was just curious because if it you said it comes from that, and it was matching up in the, the negative with the right. Negative. I thought it did, but. Now looking at it, so it would be the transpose, transpose. which is the and a two by two. I think is the inverse when your magnitude is one, because um, normally it's a transpose divided by the magnitude. So I believe this will be the inverse. All right, so now we'll get back to easy stuff, function of several, several variables. So that's the end of chapter 13. Now we're going to move into 14. Oh, on K 
Canvas, if you had trouble finding the discussions, they're there, but I think you may have to click on discussions. Is that right? Yeah. So I don't know where the other ones appeared normally that. I think it's just on the homepage, like the other two appear. But you actually have to click on like discussions. Oh. I don't know why it showed. I don't know. The two that appeared there were no more special than, than the I think I probably made them first, but I don't know. Was this open dates or closed dates? Ooh, that might be it, too. I'll check the dates on there. All right, so this is 14.1, functions of several variables. <coughs> so you might think, ah, well, we did functions of several variables, sort of. What we actually did are several variables before was our output. So our functions outputted to two or three dimensions were the functions that we looked at. So they were like r of t had some x, y, or x, y, z component functions. So they outputted to multiple dimensions. So this one, functions of several dimensions, several variables, before we had functions of x usually, or functions of t, or sometimes other letters. But it was usually the one of those two letters. So they were functions of one variable or one dimension. And now we're going to have functions that are going to uh, input more than one dimension. So we'll define a real valued function first. A real valued or scalar function is any function such that, oh, not domain, such that range of f is a subset of the real numbers. So that means it outputs into the real numbers. Doesn't output vectors, doesn't output complex numbers, it outputs real numbers. And that's what a real value function is. Now I didn't say anything about the domain. So you've pretty much worked almost exclusively with real valued functions in Calc 1 and Calc 2. We just finished a whole chapter on non-real valued functions. They were all vector valued functions. So everything we did in chapter 13 is pretty much not a real valued function. Uh, everything we're going to do in here is going to be real valued for a little while, except our inputs are going to have multiple dimensions. So we did, before we did multiple output dimensions, now we're doing multiple input dimensions. And then I think you mostly have to wait till Calc 4 before you have multiple input and multiple output dimensions. So we're sort of handling one thing at a time. All right, so you output real numbers, you have a real function. Is that supposed to be a C or what do you mean to say that? Subset. Yeah, subset. So it's basically a C. I think it's supposed to, it's actually supposed to be a sideways U. It should have kind of parallel sides with a, like it shouldn't be written like that right there. That would be a very lazy subset symbol. So don't go that way. It's a sideways union or intersection symbol, depending on which way you rotate. All right, so that means subset. And we're going to consider real valued functions with with their domain a subset of n-dimensional space. So our real value functions we're going to look at are going to have a domain that's not some intervals of numbers. These are going to be sets of vectors or sets of points, however you want to think about it. So our functions that we're going to look at are going to go from not necessarily all of our n, but a lot of our n <coughs> or some of our n into R. <laughs> so 
So if we are, so when your function f goes from two-dimensional space, so specifically two-dimensional space into scalar or one-dimensional space, so this is the sort of easiest class of functions that are not um, real valued inputs. So we're just the lowest dimension that's not one, which is two. So when you have a function, you can graph it. You can graph it in R3. And the way you do it is your inputs. You're going to take your inputs. So this goes from xy. It gives you some function of xy. So it's going to input two numbers, or input of two-dimensional vectors can output a single number. We're going to let z equal f of xy. So whatever your output is, that'll be a z value. So when you go to graph this function, what it's going to look like Whatever your domain is, is going to be, you can think of it as a shadow on the xy axis. And then the actual y value, or the height, is the output of that point. So you have some input on the xy axis, and the output is going to be a, a height. So I could write the graph is all points x, y, comma, f of x, y, where x, y is in the domain of f. So you have to make sure you're inputting points that are in the domain. <coughs> now another thing about domain, uh, you're usually going to have to look at pairs x, y, not just um, x values and not just y values separately. You're usually going to have to consider them together. And we'll do some examples on domain and what we need to be careful about. So the graph is all points, x, y, comma, uh, the output, f of x, y. And what this will graph out to be, this will form uh, a sheet or a surface. The graph looks like a surface. You could think of a topography map if you're into hiking or maps where your altitude is your output, basically. Uh, that's one example of this. Of course, then your domain is kind of whatever coordinates, uh, latitude, longitude you're using on that map. That's not the best example because the Earth is more round than it is flat, but we'll pretend that it's flat for calculus class. <coughs> and then the height. Certainly when you look at a map, it looks square. It certainly looks flat. And then you've got heights going on. You know, reality is curves around and things get way more complicated, but when we look at a map, we pretend the world's flat. So I'll try to draw some surface. But again, drawing three dimensions is pretty useless. This looks more like a blob. That's not very good. I can do better. Oh, that's beautiful. All right. Just some, I don't know, semi-parachute shaped object. Now the shadow would be, I'll try to do that with a uh, dotted area down here. The shadow it would make would be the actual domain right there. So that shadow, if you know the sun was directly overhead, that shadow would be the domain. Every point on the xy plane that is inside the domain. So the shadow is a domain. So we'll do three domain examples here. So what are the rules about domain? They've pretty much been the same for 
a year or so since pre-calculus class. Can't divide by zero. So no divided by zero. Have a negative no negatives inside square roots or any even roots really. Uh, fourth roots, sixth roots, etc. roots. We have more rules than that though. What else do we have? We have more rules than just that. How about logarithms? Oh, uh, no logs of zero? No logs of zero or negatives. So there's also a logarithm properties you have to watch out for. So I'll write the really fast rules, domain rules. Do not divide by zero. Now, dividing by zero can be sneaky in a tangent function. For example, you could be dividing by zero, but it doesn't, sort of doesn't look like it because tangent is sine over cosine. So you've got to be careful sometimes. These functions don't always look like you're dividing by zero. Secant, cosecant, same thing. Uh, so don't divide by zero. Um, even roots of uh, positives only. And we also have to worry about logs. So ln comma log, uh, the input has to be not just, it can't be zero, it has to be greater than zero. So if it was just log of x or ln of x, your x would have to be greater than zero. I think that's the only rules we need to worry about, at least off the top of my head. That's what I can come up with. All right, find domain a range of, oh, this is going to be f of x, y equals square root y minus x squared. All right, any chance to divide it by zero here? No. no. Nope. What about natural log or log of any base? No. Nope. Certainly could have negative inside that square root, though. That's pretty easy to do. So same thing we did before. We want to check and make sure that that's going on. So take what's inside the square root and make sure it is 0 or more. Now, this is easy to write down. The harder part is figuring out what x, y pairs have this property. So this is an inequality with an x and a y in it. So I could certainly subtract. Make sure if you divide and multiply, you're super careful because chances are you're multiplying or dividing by a negative if there's any variable in there. So if you're going to divide or multiply, you need to be very careful. Oh, how in the world do we do this in equality? Wouldn't it be nice if we just figured out when they were equal? That's way easier, right? So we'll start with an easy problem and then figure out when y is that much or more. So of course it means less than or equal to, but let's just pretend that it just meant equal to. If we can figure out what this looks like, then we'll come back and figure out, well, all right, I want y to be that much or more. All right, we can graph this pretty easily. Right there, y equals x squared, easy graph. So that is all points that have y equal to x squared. What part of that graph do I want for the inequality? So for example, let's say x is 1, wherever that is. Probably not accurate, but let's say that's 1 right there. So y could certainly be 1 squared, which is 1, and it could be more than that. So it could be anything that or above. Same thing if I went with 1 half, then uh, y would be a quarter or more. And same thing with 0, as 0, it could be 0, no problem, and up. And likewise, I could be anywhere above the parabola or on it. So any questions about that graphical? And we're actually graphing the domain of this function right now because the domain is points x and y. So here's what the domain looks like, graphed out. It's 
So this is not the graph of f. This is the graph of the domain of f right here. If we write set builder notation, you actually can write it out kind of easily. So uh, I see that y is x squared. Uh, we'll go. You can actually be kind of cheap and just write x y such that uh, x squared less than or equal to y. So that's really all you need to do to write at the domain. That's not necessarily very enlightening, though. No. That's just really rewriting the rule. You know, don't have a negative square root and putting it in set builder notation. So it's nice to have an intuitive understanding. Oh, the, the domain looks like this right here. Now, of course, we need to graph it. This is x, y. If we graph it out in three dimensions, I'll do the shadow down here, y, x, and we're going around the y axis. So that's what the shadow would look like on this graph. So that's our parabola on the horizontal plane, the xy axis. Now what does the height look like? That's going to be way harder to graph, so I'm not going to. You can plot a few points. Probably better to use a graphing utility. Uh, but we can talk about the range. What's the smallest value you can get out of that function? Zero. So we can get a zero out. Anytime y equals x squared, we're going to get 0 out. Is there a biggest number we can get out of there? Yeah, and go all the way to infinity, right? Make sure x isn't too big and make y huge. And then you'll get whatever number you're thinking of. So if x is 0, you let y equal the square of whatever number you're thinking of. And we just found input to get that value. So our range here, will range of f, is 0 to infinity. Now I didn't graph out the function f, all I did was draw the shadow right there because it's going to be graphing in three dimensions is not very helpful overall. I basically graphed in two dimensions, I just pretended that I was an artist and drew it in a perspective way. So I didn't really graph three dimensions, in fact I didn't even write a z-axis on there, so I really didn't graph in three dimensions. They call it isometric view or something like that. All right, next problem. Well, let's call this one g of x, y. All right, what is the only one of the three that I have to worry about for this domain? Divided by zero. Divided by zero. <laughs> so same thing we did before, I'm going to take the whole denominator and set it equal to zero. Look for bad, usually I said bad x's. Now we're looking for bad points, bad x, y points. So we're looking for bad x, y points. So we're looking to exclude every value that has the uh, x, y product equals 0. All right, zero product property right here. Multiply two numbers to get 0, that means yeah, one of zero or the other is zero, or they could both be zero. Now, logically, you can just write x equals zero or y equals zero. That catches x and y both equaling zero at the same time. So these are all the bad ones. So we have to be careful. What do the good ones look like? What are the points that don't have these properties? There's certainly some stuff that's not zero, but we want to write it out precisely. So what if we graph the bad ones? That's pretty easy to graph. And then we'll say, hey, everything we didn't graph is the good ones. So I'm going to graph the bad ones. I'm going to graph them in red, because they're bad. All right, that's a graph. What points have x coordinate 0? The y axis. What points have y coordinate 0? 
the x-axis. And of course, the origin has both of them zero, so it's as bad as all the rest of them are. All right. So what's left is our domain. So we're throwing away the axes. There's actually four pieces of the domain, but they're not the axes themselves. So there's four pieces to the domain. Now we'll go back to the black marker or pen or whatever this thing's called. And we have, uh, there's four pieces right here. There's not really a good way to draw this out. So I'm gonna just do a sort of dotted line and say so take everything up there. So I'm trying to just cut out the axes. So there's gonna be four infinite open rectangles left. So we got this piece also. Oh, it looks kind of strange. All right. Does that make sense, what I drew? I'm just trying to cut out the axes, and there's going to be four pieces left. And I'm trying to show that they are, their boundaries are open. So there's not like a uh, minimum x value that's included right there, or I should say minimum y value. You can get y as small as you want, but it just can't be 0. So let's try to write the good points in set notation. So we can actually do it really easy in set builder notation. It looks like some weird flag from a cartoon. So if we use uh, not zero, we have to use the word and. X is not zero and Y is not zero. Because if one of them is zero, it screws up the product. The product will be zero, even if just one of them is zero. Now, if you want to specifically describe one of these four, they're almost quadrants. I'm going to call them quadrants. It's basically a quadrant with the axes removed. So if I want to talk about just one of them, so we'll go just describing quadrant one in set notation. So quadrant one is that one right there. How can we describe quadrant one in set notation? So I don't want this description to cover two, three, and four. Just one quadrant one. So x greater than zero and y greater than zero. <coughs> so I could write it like that. Now I can do the same thing for, well, something similar for quadrant two and three and four. Just be careful about greater than or less than zero. <coughs> So we'll, oh, range, yeah. So that was domain. What about range? So that's a little bit more tricky. So think of any number that's not zero. Are you thinking of 42? Good, that's the right number. All right, so how do I get 42? How about x is 1 and y is the reciprocal of 42? Any number you're thinking of, that'll work for, except which number? 0. Can't get 0 out of this. You can get really small numbers, big, uh, negative and positive small numbers. So you're thinking of a tiny number, like 1 over a million? Well, I'll just choose x is 1 and y is a million. So I can get whatever small number you're thinking of, except 0. That's the one number I can't get out of this range. So our range of G will look like that. <coughs> so our last domain range, let's do H of 
X, Y, Z. All right, what rule do I need to worry about here? Well said. All right, so we're looking for bad ones, remember. So it's important to know, usually when I do a square root, I look for the good ones. And then I set up my inequality to just look for the ones that make me not have negative square root. Usually when I divide by 0, I look for bad ones. And I sort of, at the end, I look, I say it's all the stuff that's not bad. So I'm going to do the same thing here. So we're looking for bad ones. All right, we're keeping it real. So don't do some imaginary factoring here. Like, I know you could go, which probably wasn't the first thing that popped into your head. Uh, but you can factor it like that. We're not factoring it over the complex number. So not until you get into complex analysis, then you may have to do that. All right, zero product property. So the ZPP, so Z equals 0, or x squared plus y squared equals 0. All right, so z equals 0. That's pretty easy to understand. When can x squared plus y squared equal 0? So it's only very specific x, y value or values. So 0, 0 works, and that's the only one. If you have real numbers, that's the only one. So the bad ones are z equals 0 or uh, oof, x, y are both 0. So that's how this can be bad if we write it in. Now trying to graph this out is going to be less useful because you're going to have to graph. The domain is in three dimensions. So graphing out three dimensions is not terribly useful. So we're going to just go for uh, set builder notation. Now of course we have three dimensions, so points look like x, y, z, such that. So we want to look for, so I want to include the good ones here. We were looking for the bad ones up top. So such that z is not 0. Now a little bit about logic. When you negate ors, they turn to ands. And when you negate ands, they turn to ors. So when I go not. Uh, the, instead of equaling 0, it's not equal to 0. And then ands become ors when you uh, negate things. So z is not 0. And we can just look at xy. And xy is not 0, 0. Actually, we could probably graph this. This one's not too bad. What part of this graph has x, y equaling 0, 0? The origin, definitely. But that's way more than just the origin. Yeah, the holes, the origin and everything above and below the origin. So that's all bad. So I'm going to draw the z-axis in red, because we don't want to use the z-axis. So z-axis is bad. All right, what about x, y not being 0, 0? So where is x, y equaling 0, 0? Oh, wait, we just did that. Duh. Oh, z not 0. So the entire x, y plane. So now I want to be careful. If I just draw the xy axis in red, it'll look like I just want the xy axis. When I want not just to exclude those, but the entire horizontal plane, the xy plane. So I'm going to use a red marker and do my best to draw an infinitely large plane. I'm just going to label it as the uh, xy plane. So we're going to exclude the whole plane plus the entire positive and negative z-axis. 
This is sort of a weird domain. There's two pieces to it, but each piece is shaped sort of like an infinite donut. Uh, <laughs> so we're slicing that horizontally, and then there's a big piece on the top, except it's not quite an infinite rectangle. It has a hole, an infinite hole drilled all the way through it. And the same thing on the bottom. So they have weird shapes. All right, it's a good time to end.